Hi, everybody. Fide Master Dennis Monacresis here for ChessLecture.com. And we keep looking at some great games by the late Victor Korshnoi. As I mentioned last time, he defeated nine world champions. And I did a little checking since last time. And he did not play Nakamura or um, Geary. And he did not have any wins against the Fide world champions except for Ponomaria. So if you count Ponomaria, you get... 10 world champions that he's beaten, even if the 10th is with an asterisk. And if Karawana does become the world champion someday, it will be 11th. And this is what we're going to see today. We're going to look at his victory over Fabiano Caruana from Gibraltar in 2011. So this was played two months before Korshmai turned 80 years old. Unbelievable. So Caruana was not a 2800 back then, but hey, he was 2721. That's still awfully good. Korchnoi's rating had gone down a little bit, you know, well, a bit. He was 25-44, so he was no longer a 2,600-rated player. But 25-44 is pretty acceptable for a 79-year-old man. And it probably went up a little bit after this event. As I recall, he had a very good event, and he had winning chances against uh, Vallejo in the last round. If he had, it was also 2,700. So if he had beaten him there, I mean, it would have been just a, a huge rating gain for him in the tournament. As it was, it still gained, I think, a little bit, but... Uh, not, not a huge number of points. It's still a very good tournament for anybody. And again, we're talking about a 79-year-old man. It's, uh, it's staggering. All right, so let's take a look at this game, which is really a remarkable achievement by Korshnoi. Uh, Korshnoi play this game, plays this game with just tremendous youthful vigor. I mean, very creatively, very energetically. And... Uh, as I said in the last video, when he was a younger player, he wasn't really a player who was fantastic when it came to, to seizing and fighting for the initiative and playing kind of you know wild attacking chess. In this game, he does it. So you know, the young Korshnoi is busy playing defensive and positional chess. The older Korshnoi, at least in this game, is a uh, firebrand. So let's have a look at this uh, this insane game. So Korshnoi is black, no less. And Fabiano is white. So e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, bishop e5, a6. And here, Caruana decides to play d3. d3 lines are fairly popular nowadays against all sorts of Rui Lopez's, especially the Berlin, but also it comes up in a lot of anti marshals and even here, either on move 5 or on move 6. So the most popular version is to go castles, bishop e7, and now d3. But because uh, Korshnoi was a, a big, fran big fan of the, uh, the open Rui, which is with knight takes e4, perhaps for that reason, Caruana decided to play d3 here. Now, the drawback of playing d3 here, and the reason why most people play it on move 6 instead, and prefer to, uh, to chance the open Rui, is that here black can play a little bit more actively. You know, b5, bishop b3, and then not bishop to e7, but bishop to c5. So all of these lines are playable for both sides, but this is the reason why most people prefer to wait until black has already committed his bishop to e7 from here, after castles, to play d3. Anyway, Caruana preferred d3, and he got away with it, so to speak, because Korshnoi played d6. Okay, white plays c3, and now Korshnoi plays bishop to e7. In some contexts, you might think of this move as, as kind of a waste of a tempo, really, or of multiple tempi, because there are an awful lot of rulies where, okay, after bishop to e7, black castles, brings the rook to e8, brings bishop f8, g6, bishop g7, and you wonder, well, why in the world did you play bishop to e7 in the first place? But Korshnoi is going to handle this uh, quite a bit differently. But that is why, in this position, the most common move for black is g6, and then bishop g7, and so on. Okay. So bishop e7 was played, castles, castles, rook e1. And here the most usual way to go is b5, and after the bishop drops back to c2, then d5, knight b to d2, and so on. And uh, white is fighting for an edge, but whether he actually has anything serious or not, that's again kind of a practical matter. But that's how things usually go. Of course, I played something rather aggressive, though. Knight to d7. So he's not playing for the d5 advance or anything like that. He's not trying to kind of uh, stabilize and, and uh, go for a solid approach. 
where he neutralizes the, the center. Instead, he's going for f5. So he's going for kind of, well, the, the amazing thing is he's kind of going for King's Indian style play. And those of you who know anything about Korshner, you know that he is uh, a player who has a rather dim view of the King's Indian. And he, he, he kind of made it his, one of his uh, missions in life as a chess player to try to, uh, to squash this, this opening. So this is not exactly, of course, the same as a, as a King's Indian. We don't have this locked pawn structure with the pawns on d5 and c4 and white enjoying this big queen tight space advantage. But still, it's, it's at least analogous to it. So it's kind of amusing to see him go for this uh, kind of direct uh, attacking approach. All right, here, Karawana played bishop to e3, which is certainly playable. Two other moves that are worth considering are knight b to d2 and d4. All right, so he plays bishop to e3, though. And one point of this is that the move that black would like to play here is knight to c5. But, of course, this would be an atrociously bad move because white will simply give up both bishops, giving black the, the so-called Irish pawn center, kind of a snide way of referring to triple pawns, and then white will further help himself to the e-pawn. So this is altogether unsatisfactory for black despite the possession of the bishop here. So with knight c5 out, black needs to do something else. In the game, of course, I play knight to b6. In a couple of later games, though, black decided to, uh, to handle the attack a little bit differently. In a game Grandelius against Nidich played last year, in 2015, Nidich just went directly for f5. Takes, takes, bishop b3 check, king h8, knight b to d2, he dropped the bishop back, d4. It's an interesting position. Uh, Nidich did go on to win pretty quickly, but at this point, white should be more or less okay. And then there's another game. This was between Gregorians and another uh, kind of old-time-ish great player, uh, Alexander Bilyowski, played in 2013. So Bilyowski played king h8. This, I think, more or less comes to something like a transposition. Uh, so you can see that game in the notes. So rather than show it to you, uh, I'll kind of leave that for you because I don't want to show you what happens in the Korshnoi game until we get there. So king h8 is possible as well, though. All right. Um, in the game, as I said, Korshner played knight to b6, white played bishop to b3, pinning the f-pawn, so black moves the king over. And here, there's, uh, there's one predecessor game, not a high-level one, but decent players, you know, 2200 against the 2400. And in that game, white played d4, and then black didn't go for an f f5 plan, at least not right away. Played bishop g4 h3, bishop h5, knight b to d2, takes, takes, d5, e5, and then f5. So very, very different. Uh, it's an interesting game and an interesting idea, but again, just very, very different from what we've got. So that can be checked out as well, but let's just uh, focus on this game. So Caruana played knight b to d2. Obviously, he knows what's coming, and he's not worried about it. So f5 was played by, by Victor Korchman. Now, here white played bishop takes b6, and I don't know that this had to be played right away. I mean, if black wants to play f4, and I'm not sure he does, but if he does want to play f4, well, white can always play bishop takes b6 then. So I don't know that it needed to be played immediately. That said, it's not really a mistake, so he does it. Takes, takes, and now bishop to d5. This was perhaps the idea. Okay, so now... What do you suppose Korshnoi does in this position? So White's bishop looks very nice on d5. It's not really clear what black is going to do here. Well, Korshnoi realizes that he needs to, to make the initiative, or he needs to seize the initiative and, and, and prosecute it, and push with it. So he goes g5. So a very bold and exciting move, but it's come, it comes with a big threat. So White would love to just play e takes f5. This would be positionally desirable clearing e4 for his pieces and trying to, uh, to, to seize the light squares, but the bad news is that g4 is an oops. The, the knight is trapped, so white has some compensation for it, but not nearly enough. So that would be, that would be bad. So another option is to play knight c4 to clear d2 from the knight. And then black goes g4, knight f to d2, and f4. And this looks kind of scary for white too. I mean, Black has an enormous space advantage on the king side, 
And also white can't transfer his knight to e3, so it's harder for white to kind of usefully shuttle his pieces to his king's vicinity. So I think this position is also quite pleasant for black. So from here, Caruana plays h3, and now forward, g4, takes, takes, knight h2. All right, well, black does have the open f-file now. He has the two bishops, although they don't look overwhelmingly uh, efficient at the moment. And there might in some cases be a g3 battering ram, although probably it would make more sense for, for the moment at least for black to keep the pawn and try to build up behind it. So here he plays bishop to g5. It would have been interesting, though, to play bishop to h4, inducing g3, and only then go to g5. And there, there are two reasons why you might want to do this. One is that it can create a hook with h5, h4 on the g-pawn. White could take on g4, but that's very risky. It may not be a good idea at all. But that at least needs to be considered. And maybe, unfortunately, I don't know if he's worried about that or not. But yeah, I don't think he's worried about that. Because he plays bishop g5, sacking the pawn. Well, it's not sacking yet, sorry. Knight g4, you just take on g4 and then take on d2. So there's no sack. You have time for h5. So the thing is, the g3 pawn becomes a hook. The other thing is that there might be some lines where a white knight might go to f1. Let me get rid of all the arrows here. Where a white knight goes to f1, whichever one, and then hops to g3. So that, of course, has been taken off the table. So it's an interesting little finesse. But, of course, I went for the more straightforward bishop to g5. Okay, knight c4, b5, knight e3. And here, kind of like Karawada's decision a few moves ago to play bishop takes the knight on b6, I think here, too, Korshnoi could have waited to play bishop takes e3 and maybe play h5, just keeping his powder dry, so to speak, and building before committing. Because this bishop might still have something useful it can do. Okay, be that as it may, he took. White took, queen f6, and here white played queen e1, which is okay, though queen d2 maybe freeing up the rook to come to f1 might be, I don't know if it's a better idea, it's just an alternative idea. The, uh, the positive point of queen to e1, though, is that white wants to maybe go f3 and then queen to g3. So it's, uh, for the moment, it looks like it's more passive, but the idea is to have the queen activated on the king side in some useful way. All right, here black could consider queen to g5, but knight to e7 is certainly also decent. Um, here, an interesting move for white is rook to d1, which, like the move played by Caruana, allows the exchange, but the idea is to, to maybe help repair this. So if knight e5, e5, when white plays d4, if black takes, the rook can capture on d4 and can maybe exert some pressure horizontally as well as vertically. Well, it doesn't exert any pressure vertically, here, but, uh, as opposed to looking for some place where it would exert vertical pressure. So that was an interesting idea. But in the game, Caruana sticks to the whole plan of queen e1, the point of queen e1, he plays f3. So now, Korshnoi takes, and this is a good move. Um, the reason why it's worth pointing out, and you might think, well, this is obvious. It, it doubles white's pawns, it gets rid of the strong bishop on d5, and all of that is true. But there are two drawbacks to it. One is that the e-file opens up, and when white plays d4, White's rook and queen might be able to use the, the, the e-file. So that may not prove innocuous. Secondly, the bishop on d5, although it looks nice, in some ways it's, it's a bit of a hood ornament. So it looks, it looks nice, but it, it has no functional value. Now, it's not quite that bad, but black can quite easily work around it. So a knight going into g6 and f4 or h4, for instance, uh, could prove rather irritating for, for white. So the bishop on d5, of course, it's not useless, and it, it does a nice job of keeping f7 and g8 under control, which makes it harder for black to, to really get his rooks operating at full capacity. But they can. So queen h4, for instance. Let me get rid of this stuff again. So queen h4, rook up. This bishop moves, and the rook comes here. This rook from f6 can move to g6 or h6. So the bishop on d5 can be a little bit of a nuisance for black, but it can be worked around. Of course, I realized that, all right, even though it has, there are pros and cons for both uh, taking and not taking, he decided to take, and this seems to be overall the best decision. So knight e5, ed5, rook g8, and now instead of queen of g3, as consistent as that is, it probably would have been better to play rook to d1. 
with the idea of rook to d2. So again, uh, getting the rook working horizontally, uh, not just vertically, is a good idea. So another way of thinking about it is that this old defensive rule that you want to defend as economically as you can. So if you can defend something with the rook instead of a queen, then all things being equal, defend it with the rook instead. So I think that might have been a little bit better, but um, Carl wanted to play queen to g3. So now takes, takes, and a nice move here by Korshkoi, bishop to f5. Again, it's an obvious kind of move. You're developing a piece, you're avoiding trading queens, which certainly you don't want to do because you're attacking. But it does take uh, a bit of guts because you're walking into a pin. But Korshkoi, of course, has calculated that there's nothing really too worrisome that could come of it. So the game went rook f1, and now rook to g5. So the first important point is that if white plays g4, which looks scary for a moment, you can see that black just plays queen to g6, and white can't take. Taking with the pawn is illegal, taking with the queen is bad, and meanwhile, the, uh, the bishop will run away next move. He's threatening to take on g4, and he's threatening to take on d3, because rook d3, e4, is a fork on the queen and rook. So g4 would be a bad move. Black would, in fact, be winning there. An alternative for white that's not bad is rook f2, and then after rook a to g8 to play knight f1. This looks like a better defense, although black should still be better here. In the game, white played king to h1, which is natural, so he wants to have g4, and he wants to get off the g-file, but this turns out not to be a very good move. And a few moves later, he really should bring the king back to g1. All right, so here black has a number of good moves. Rook a to g8 is good. Um, an arrow, so that would be a good move. Queen g6 would be a good move, and obviously the two moves in tandem might turn out to be good as well. But um, the move played in the game was not bad either. Of course, might play queen h6. Caruana plays rook f2, giving a little more support to the g-pawn, and potentially to the knight on h2 if he needs to, to push this pawn. Okay, black plays rook a to g8. And now, uh, perhaps worried that there might be some discovered attacks coming on this rook on e1, he plays the move rook to e1. But the best move is one that looks ridiculous, and that's king to g1, but this, this did need to be played. Instead, after rook to e1, he gets into some trouble. Uh, yeah, so rook e1. Here, the best move was rook to h5, but what course I played was also quite strong. He plays queen g6, tripling up, and now Caruana needed to play maybe knight to f1. That would have given him some chances to hold here. So white loses, loses the pawn or gives it up, but he at least manages to establish decent enough coordination that he can keep fighting. So it would have been more precise back here for black to play rook h5 first, inducing g3, and now playing queen g6 which attacks the g3 pawn and attacks the d3 pawn. And um, if rook to e3, then bishop takes d3. So a tactic I mentioned before, and that we'll see again later on in the game, would probably decide it here. Okay. So let's go back to the game. Queen g6, rook e3. Yeah, so knight f1 had to be played, but now there's that same trick. Bishop takes d3, and of course, white cannot take because of e4. So Caruana played king to g1 now, e4, queen h3, and rook takes d5. So Korshnoi is up two pawns for nothing, but there's time trouble. He's got nine moves still to make. So uh, he could have finished the game off a little bit more cleanly, but he never does let Caruana off the hook to his credit. All right, here white should probably play queen h4, but Caruana may well have been in time trouble too. He plays queen to d7. Here, bishop to c4 is the best move, hitting the pawn and especially threatening a back rank check here. But um, after queen d7, played rook g5, which is not bad. g4, queen h6, rook f7. Here, though, Korshnoi did miss a very nice opportunity. This, this was a big one. So he can basically win on the spot uh, right now. So he missed the following move, rook h5. So this is just a crusher hitting the knight and hitting the rook on e3. So that would have more or less forced resignation on the spot. So he missed that chance, but while his move was, again, not best, it by no means uh, spoiled the win. 
So look 5 to g7, takes. Now it's like that would spoil the win here is queen e3 check, because the problem is when you take this, then there's this perpetual here. So of course you don't need to not fall for this one. You just play rook takes g7, queen d8, rook g8, queen b6, queen f6, queen b7, rook f8, threatening a decisive penetration, queen a7, and here actually black could win with queen f2 right away, but last move of the time control, he just decided to play it safe. He plays b4, which is not a bad move. So it defends the a6 pawn, and it puts pressure here. So it does do some, some good things, even if it wasn't the, the most incisive move. Okay, Caruana plays rook h3. Hey, you never know. Mate 1 could, uh, could be missed. Queen g7, it wasn't missed. And now the time control has been made. Nobody lost on time, unlike the previous show's game between Korshner and Carlson. And here it's essentially time for Caruana to deal with the wreckage of his position. He's only a pawn down at the moment, but Black's positional advantage is overwhelming. So this is not one of these, uh, not a situation where the adage about all rook endings being drawn will, will come to pass. And not only because there's the bishop and knight on the board, not to mention the queens. So White could trade queens and he can even get his material back with c takes b4, but after d5, this pawn duel in the center is going to easily overwhelm white's defensive capacities. So, for that reason, Caruana decides to keep the queens on for the moment, queen e3, take, 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 so now black is up two pawns, and white's king is still in bad shape. Caruana plays rook h5, in part to give his king uh, a little bit more breathing space, but Korshnoi, with time to think, finishes the game very effectively. So he plays d5, which is a nice move. Uh, rook takes d5 would not work well. Uh, the rook is kind of needed to protect the king in some variations. So he goes g5, and, well, this is basically the big threat that's going to be decisive in almost every case. Queen a1 check, king g2, bishop f1 check, king g3, and after queen to e5 check, Caruana had had enough. So the game could continue king to g4, d4, and the, the white queen needs to keep f4 control, as you can see here. That's checkmate. So queen to d2 is semi-forced, or queen to c1, but then e3, and, well, you can save your queen or you can save your king, but you can't do both. And Actually, I'm not even sure you can save your king. I mean, maybe you can save it for a handful of moves at most. So in this position, after queen to e5 check, Caruana had had enough. And the grand old man of 20th century chess showed that even in the 21st century, near the age of 80, he could still play, not just play, but play great chess and beat a, a world-class opponent. Amazing. So I hope you guys enjoyed this. Hopefully, uh, in, in the wake of Korshnoi's passing, Many of you who may not have been as familiar with his chess and his career will be inspired to look up his games. I mean, he's one of these players that really, you don't find anybody in chess history who plays like him. Uh, Korshnoi himself said that maybe Laster was something of an inspiration to him, but I think primarily for this kind of fighting positional style, uh, there are some resemblances, although the openings that they played are, are generally quite different because of the, the different time periods. But there is that kind of, uh, same kind of spirit, same kind of fighting approach, this uh, liking for slightly, not tremendously, but slightly off the beaten track opening systems. But, um, yeah, I mean, the guy is, is a, a pretty unique player. And uh, certainly, I think, someone, that, someone whose games deserve uh, a lot of attention, the attention that they received in previous generations. So the guy, as I said, was a, a legend of, of the game. And we will almost certainly look at uh, more of his games in the weeks to come. So I hope you guys enjoyed it. If not, well, I don't know what to tell you because, again, this is, this is good stuff. Uh, not just because he's 79 years old, but it's just, it's just a great game, period. All right. So, again, with that, I will call it a day. Until next time, this is Fide Master, Dennis Monacrucis, signing off for ChessLecture.com. Bye-bye.